When looking at how Shane Beamer and Will Muschamp both performed in their first two years in Columbia, one of these two coaches clearly elevated the status of South Carolina's football program. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock Athletics. I am Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and you can also find my written work over on Gamecocks Digest on SI.com. Thank y'all so much for making the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast your first listen or watch here today. We are free and available both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. When it comes to conversation in the world of sports regarding how certain athletes or coaches have performed compared to some of their counterparts, we can't help but make comparisons. It's what helps to create great debates regarding maybe which player was better, which coach was better. And for South Carolina, while there probably isn't a question of which coach has been better out of the last two coaches for South Carolina's football program, it's pretty clear that while some of the numbers are similar from their first two seasons, Shane Beamer has elevated South Carolina's football program more so than Will Muschamp did, and he has a better chance of sustaining the success he's had so far. So to get into this conversation, let's first of all break down the comparison between Shane Beamer and Will Muschamp's first two years here by the numbers. Starting off with the similarities between both coaches. Both Shane Beamer and Will Muschamp finished their first two seasons in Columbia with a 15-11 and overall record. And from a betting or gambling standpoint, both coaches won seven games each as an outright underdog in the eyes of Vegas oddsmakers. Now, casual observers and opposing fans who dislike South Carolina, let's just be honest, would look at these numbers, would look at these facts and say that this means that Shane Beamer has effectively done what Will Muschamp did over his first two years at South Carolina. But for all of us who watch South Carolina religiously, follow the program closely, We all know that the similarities between both of these coaches aren't the same in terms of what they've actually done in their first two seasons. And that leads me into the differences between both of these coaches. Starting off with the biggest difference. In terms of one-score ball games, Will Muschamp was involved in 13 one-score affairs in his first two seasons. That accounted for 50% of the games that he coached in. While Shane Beamer was involved in six one-score games in his first two seasons, accounting for 23.1% of his total amount of games. Now, Will Muschamp won 10 of the 13 one-score games that he was a part of. And this accounted for 66% of his win total from his first two seasons. Shane Beamer, on the other hand, won four of the six one-score games that he was a part of in his first two years at South Carolina. And this accounted for 26.7% of Shane Beamer's win total from his first two seasons. Now, when looking at Will Muschamp's number specifically, and the fact that he won 10 of his 13 one-score games in his first two years here with the Gamecocks. There's two different ways that people could interpret this. One, Shane Beamer was a coach that thrived in close ball games, made good in-game adjustments, and all of that added up at the very end of the day. Or, another way to interpret that would have been Will Muschamp was catching some lucky breaks in different ways, and at some point... His luck was going to run out, and the law of averages was going to catch up to him. Well, 
That was certainly the case, and honestly, even more so than what I just stated. Because, uh, well, Bush Champ, it turned out that the way that he was winning at South Carolina in his first two years was pretty volatile in the sense that it was not going to stick long term. South Carolina could not keep winning all of these one score fairs, which led to them progressing in the win loss column. Eventually, they were going to start dropping more of those games than they did at the beginning of the Will Muschamp era, and that's how it all played out. Now, knowing this information, how should we interpret Shane Beamer's numbers in regards to one-score games? Again, Shane Beamer won four of the six one-score games that he coached in in his first two years here at South Carolina. Here's what we should take away from that. When Shane Beamer and South Carolina are in a groove in a football game. Rarely do they slip up. And when they have been in tight ball games, they have proven that they can adapt and overcome the odds that are stacked against them. This leads to more convincing wins, which leads to more trust in future outcomes that is given to you from the media which leads to more exposure and subsequently plenty of other benefits for your football program. Now, here's the other difference between Shane Beamer and Will Muschamp's first two years here at South Carolina. In terms of facing top 25 opponents, Will Muschamp only won one game against a top 25 team out of the seven that he was a part of in his first two years in Columbia, Shane Beamer won three games against top 25 opponents out of the eight that he coached in throughout his first two years at South Carolina. So what should we take away from this? Well, Shane Beamer, he won multiple games against national brand teams, specifically Tennessee and Clemson at the end of the 2022 regular season. Thus, He elevated South Carolina's stature as a football program. In the same vein, Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks defeated teams that they had struggled against for the previous decade. They defeated Kentucky in Lexington for the first time since 2012. They defeated Clemson for the first time since 2013. They defeated the Tennessee Volunteers, who won 11 games this past season, and looked to be a shoe-win for the college football playoff before the Gamecocks knocked them off in Columbia. Overall, looking back at those top 25 victories, those wins validate what Shane Beamer is doing in Columbia currently, and it indicates that more can be done at South Carolina. And that is sort of the great separator, the great differentiating factor between Shane Beamer and Will Muschamp. Yes, both of these coaches in their first two years won the same amount of ball games. Congratulations. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Yes, they both have won multiple close ball games. They both won multiple games as underdogs. But the thing is, Shane Beamer has had more convincing wins and much, much more notable wins compared to Will Muschamp. As we wound up figuring out by the end of the Will Muschamp tenure, Will Muschamp just was not a big game coach. He was not a guy that could win games that he maybe wasn't supposed to win, at least against the very best in the entire sport. Outside of Tennessee in 2016 and Georgia in 2019, he never could beat a really solid team. Shane Beamer not even with his own players, for the most part, that is, has already done that in just his first two years at South Carolina. And that is also a big signal that he could sustain the success he's already had at South Carolina. Does it mean that South Carolina is going to continue to progress linearly in terms of their win-loss record? No, it doesn't. South Carolina is probably going to eventually take a step back in terms of the win-loss column. But it doesn't mean that Gamecock fans should automatically panic and think that we're going to see a repeat of what all happened in the second half of the Will Muschamp era. I don't think that's going to happen with Shane Beamer, and I think the numbers pan out that way. 
Shane Beamer has shown he could be a coach who could potentially help South Carolina finally win some championships. And to win championships, you gotta have championship level depth. But which positions do you need that championship depth? And regarding those positions, how is South Carolina faring right now in terms of that championship depth? We're going to dive into all that a little bit deeper in just a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. But first, today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Major League Baseball has reached the halfway point of the regular season, and right now, you can take your first swing at betting on MLB games on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. Right now, the Atlanta Braves' Matt Olson has 28 home runs, which ranks second in Major League Baseball behind Shohei Otani, who has 31. So because of this, FanDuel has set some pretty enticing odds on Matt Olson to be Major League Baseball's home run leader by the end of the regular season. Those odds currently are plus 210 behind Shohei Otani's plus 100. If you think that Matt Olson could be the Major League's home run leader by the end of the regular season, then Go sign up today on FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOnCollege and you can get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel is the official betting partner of Major League Baseball. Welcome back to this Wednesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day in just 30 minutes. Thank you once again to all of you everydayers for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your daily choice for South Carolina Gamecock sports coverage. All right, now let's dive into championship depth, which we talked about before on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But for this portion of today's show, I want to talk about what positions do you need to see championship depth accumulate at? Where would you rank those positions? And how is South Carolina faring at each of those positions? I made a quick objective ranking of multiple position groups that I'm going to discuss with you all real quick. Feel free to let me know your thoughts, whether you're listening to today's show or you're watching it on YouTube. At number one, the position that needs championship depth the most by far is the quarterback position. It is indeed the position that essentially makes or breaks a football team's hopes of accomplishing their end goals for any particular football season. It's probably how some people feel about Spencer Rattler for South Carolina this year. If the Gamecocks are going to win eight, nine games or, you know, at least exceed their win total from last year, they're going to need Spencer Rattler to likely go off in 2023. If Spencer Rattler maybe cannot get past his inconsistency issues, then maybe that does not end up being the case. But how is South Carolina doing there in terms of their depth? Well, I would say their depth is pretty solid. I'm not going to call it championship depth just yet, but the Gamecocks are certainly getting there. In 2024, their quarterback depth chart as of right now could be Luke Doty, Lenore Sellers, Tanner Bailey, Dante Reno, and Colton Gather. All these quarterbacks were four stars coming out of high school, which, in my opinion, from a recruiting standpoint, would be the deepest quarterback room South Carolina has ever had on their roster, should it play out this way. Now, the second position group where you need to see championship depth the most, in my opinion, is offensive line. I still think that this is a sport where you have got to have talent in the trenches. You cannot go out there with an offensive line that is going to be struggling or maybe inconsistent in both maybe run and pass blocking. You've got to have the hog mollies, as they would say, up front to protect your quarterback and give your running game a decent chance of at least keeping defenses honest. For South Carolina, right now, their offensive line depth is okay. But it is certainly getting better and maybe in another recruiting class could end up being one of the better units in the SEC. Some notable players for 2024 at this position group could be guys like Marquis Anderson 
Olawata Simbabalade, Cam Pringle, Josiah Thompson, Blake Franks, Travon Baugh, Jatavia Shivers. There's multiple guys you could throw out there at that spot. The issue is all these guys will either be second year or first year offensive linemen in the program. Typically, it takes time for those guys to develop at that position group. So, again, they're getting closer, they're getting better, but they still need another recruiting class of good offensive line before I would say this is a championship caliber position unit. At number three, I've got the wide receiver position. You've got someone that can throw the football. you got people that can protect the person throwing the football. But at the same time, if you're going to win a championship, you've got to have some studs at the wide receiver position. How is South Carolina doing there as of right now? How do they look for 2024? Well, right now I'd say the depth is not exactly great. I think that they need some pieces to come through in this 2024 class to change that a little bit because as of this moment, the 2024 wide receiver group for South Carolina could look something like this. You got Nicholas Harper. That's a pretty doggone good start. Mazio Bennett, a freshman that I think could do quite well in South Carolina's offense in 2024. But then you see a bit of a drop off in terms of at least proven experience. Because then you got Landon Sampson, Omega Blake, Kelton Henderson, Peyton Mangrum, and some others as well. Again, it's not like it's totally devoid of talent behind Nicholas Harper and Mazio Bennett in this scenario, but we don't know yet what these guys can really do if they're the ones that are being heavily relied on in this offense. So that's why I think that depth here, it's a good ways away from being championship depth. They've got to get more guys in that wide receiver room. At number four, I've got the defensive line position group. Again, going back to sort of the idea of you need to be solid in the trenches if you want to win a championship. Offensive line, I still think, is more important than defensive line, but defensive line is not far behind it, sitting here at number four. For South Carolina right now, I think that their depth is pretty good depending on where you look on their defensive line, but they still need a few more pieces, specifically at the defensive end position. When looking at the 2024 group that South Carolina could have coming back, the Gamecocks have a ton of talent here. You got Alex Boogie Huntley who could come back as a sixth year player. You've got TJ Sanders who could wind up coming back. Nick Barrett, Elijah Davis, Xavier McLeod would be a second year player in the program. Terrell Dawkins could return. Brian Thomas Jr., Jatias Gear, and Desmond Umeo Zulu, and potentially some other guys if they join the Gamecocks 2024 class. So again, talent is pretty good, but you still need a little more depth at the edge position before I would say the defensive line is a championship caliber defensive line for South Carolina. At number five, I've got the cornerback position. If you're going to be facing offenses, and these days you're going to, where there's going to be some superstar wide receivers, some guys that are just going to make your defense probably pay more often than not, You've got to have some cornerbacks that can handle their own in one-on-one -on -one situations. So cornerback, I got listed here at number five. Now, how does South Carolina look here right now? Well, again, this is a position group that is getting better in terms of overall depth and talent, but I still think that they're one recruiting class away before you could sit there and say it's a championship caliber group. South Carolina in 2024 would likely have players like O. Donnell Fortune, Emery Floyd, Kawan Banks, Keenan Nelson Jr., David Spalding, Fakari Swain, and Braden Lee all on this roster. That's a pretty solid group right there of both guys that at this point would have had multiple years of experience in Clayton White's system and in this football program, and also some talented young bucks who would be the future of that spot. But you still need a couple more guys before I'm willing to say it's championship caliber. The final position that I think needs to have championship depth in order to obviously win a title is the free safety position. I'm very specific about this because while I just mentioned that you need some real solid lockdown potential type corners on your roster to win a title, you're going to eventually have a game where even the best of cornerbacks are not going to be able to completely hold off an opposing team's wide receiver core. Think of Georgia versus Ohio State in the college football playoff this past football season. 
You've got to have a safety that can help protect your corners over the top, which is why I list free safety on this list. For South Carolina right now at this spot, I think that it's a pretty deep group, but it's admittedly also kind of hard to categorize South Carolina safeties because of the skill sets of a lot of these guys, which is primarily surrounding their abilities in rush defense. But for the fun of it, for the 2024 group at free safety, I listed guys like Nick Evan Worry, Jalen Kilgore, and Kelvin Hunter. Three guys that I think would be perfectly capable of playing that free safety spot. At strong safety, I probably would see maybe DQ Smith more likely stick in there. Maybe a guy like Peyton Williams also playing there as well. And potentially a guy like a David Busey, should he get moved to the safety position in 2024 once he arrives in Columbia. But either way, those are the positions where I think you need to have championship depth the most. And those are my overall thoughts for South Carolina at each of those position groups. Again, they're pretty good at certain spots, but there's other areas where they've still got a little ways to go before you could sit there and say, that's a position group that can help this team win a conference or national title. You don't need to have five stars literally at every level of the roster like Georgia does to win a national title. You definitely need talent. But I don't think that this sport has reached the point where you've just got to have Georgia or Alabama level talent to win a title. You can win a title without having five stars literally littered across your depth chart at every position group. But you still got to nail certain spots on your roster. And I think that South Carolina is definitely getting closer to being able to say that they have done just that. Alrighty, now for the final portion of today's show, I want to go back to South Carolina's women's basketball team once again. If you're an everyday, then you recall on yesterday's show that I talked about Asia Wilson and Aaliyah Boston and how the two of them have both performed so far this current WNBA season. But for today's show, I want to come back to South Carolina's roster that they have here in Columbia right now. And bring up a question that I think could have a bevy of answers, depending on who you ask. Which player is going to be the X factor for South Carolina's women's basketball team this upcoming season? Again, I think there's multiple options here to fit this question. I think you could throw out someone like a Camilla Cardoso. I think you could throw out someone like Tahina Pow Pow. And also someone like a Bree Hall. But for me, my answer to this question is Raven Johnson. For the third straight season, head coach Don Staley is going to have a new player running the point for her team. And I know that Raven Johnson got a ton of playing time this past season. But the thing is, Raven Johnson was not the starter for the majority of the games that took place this past winter. And when you are the starter, you've got to have a different mentality about yourself, about your game, and when it comes to your overall confidence of being able to go out there and execute what your coach wants you to do. There's a bigger, more loftier set of expectations that are placed on you when you are a starter. You are essentially being an example for all of your teammates that are on the bench, those that are, that are not starting, those that are maybe scrapping for some of the extra minutes that they could possibly get because of a team like South Carolina being so deep. You set the example. You're one of the players that sets the example, which is why being a starter is different than being maybe say the sixth player or the first one off the bench in Raven Johnson's case. Now in terms of point guards who can run and facilitate Dawn Staley's offense, the way that she wants things to look out there on the court. Raven Johnson is the best that I can remember ever seeing in the Don Staley era. And I think that if you're going to bring up a close second, maybe Taisha Harris could be in this conversation. But what Raven Johnson does on the floor, it's just different than what we've seen from most Gamecock point guards that have played under Don Staley's watch. What makes Raven different is how she orchestrates the spacing on the floor with her teammates, knowing we're the best shot selection is on the floor, how she operates the offense in the fast break, and essentially the multifaceted stress that she puts on opposing defense. Raven Johnson does so much 
that the stats she can't ever account for. She is such an intelligent player. She's got great court vision. She's got really good athleticism. And the thing is, she's only going to be better in terms of her speed and her burst of acceleration this year because now it will have been almost two years since she originally tore her ACL. That first season back, it always takes you a little bit to get your feet back under you. That's not going to be the case for Raven Johnson this year. Now, why is Raven Johnson going to be the X factor for Saffron's women's basketball team this next season, in my opinion? Well, this team is going to make it back to the Final Four. Go on a deep postseason run either way in 2024. In my opinion, this year's squad is going to have to be more team-oriented in terms of scoring the basketball. Now, that's not to say that they weren't team-oriented at all this past season. But my point is... Everybody on the roster, those that play significant minutes, they're all going to have to pull their own weight a little bit more because you don't have an Aaliyah Boston or Zy Cook type player on this team this year that can just take over games from a scoring standpoint on the offensive end. Sure, Camila Cardoso could definitely be someone that scores about 16 plus points a game, maybe. Maybe Malaysia Full Wiley comes in and just bursts onto the scene and is somebody that is a high-volume scorer on offense like Zaya Cook. But we still have yet to see it with both of them. Camilla Cardoso, she has yet to be in the starting lineup for this team. She's been able to basically come off the bench her first years in Columbia. Malaysia Fulwiley, she's going to be a true freshman. And I've said before on this show, I think she could be the next big superstar under Don Staley's watch. But again, we still have to see her at least prove it somewhat before we could start fully diving into those expectations. Now, to get back to Raven Johnson, in terms of shooting, Raven does not have much that she does, or at least she doesn't try to necessarily take over on offense in terms of trying to score the basketball. That's not the way at least she operated this past season. Now, she does have the ability to be crafty around the rim when she is driving to the basket, but... The one thing that Raven Johnson could do quite well if she works at it this offseason is shoot three-pointers. Raven Johnson has got a good stroke. She is somebody that was able to do this in high school. She is someone that can make teams pay from behind the three-point line. And the thing is, with the attention that Camilla Cardoso is going to draw in the paint, the athleticism that both Ashlyn Watkins and Sanai Fagan both provide, and these spacing problems that someone like a Chloe Kitts, Malaysia Full Wiley, and a Tahina Pow Pow could create, Raven Johnson is going to have her fair share of opportunities and open shots from behind the arc, in my opinion. And this year, unlike last year, she's going to have to make defenses respect that part of her game a lot more. She's going to have to make them pay a lot more for leaving her open because, again, I don't think that there is a dominant score that can just simply take over an entire basketball game on the team this year. There is great pieces in terms of people who can score 15, 16, 18, 20 points, but no one that can necessarily maybe do that consistently like Zy Cook or Leah Boston. So everyone's going to have to pitch in more, and for that reason, Raven Johnson and in my opinion, her three-point shooting and willingness to take more of those shots, that is going to be the X factor for this team in 2023. Because here's the thing. If Raven Johnson can take more three-point shots and be efficient with it at the same time and combine that with everything else she already does for South Carolina's offense, y'all, it is going to open up everything for the Gamecocks this next season they could be even more dangerous on the offensive end if that is indeed how things play out for that reason i think raven johnson is the biggest x factor for this team this next winter who do you think the biggest x factor is going to be how do you think shane beamer has elevated south Carolina's football program to this point in his career compared to say will muschamp the previous coach here in columbia and also which position groups do you think need to have championship depth the most? 
Let me know your thoughts on all those topics down below in the comments section if you watch today's show on YouTube. Or, if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app, you can shoot me a direct message on Twitter, at A-Line underscore SC, and I'll try to respond to your message as quickly as I see it. Once again, thank y'all so much for tuning in to today's edition of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all have a great rest of your Wednesday, and I will catch y'all on the next show of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast.